Stanley Nelson has a retrospective coming to the Criterion Channel in February. He talks to me about his career and his new film, Attica. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Stanley Nelson has been making documentaries since the 1980s. Now the Criterion Channel celebrates his work with a collection titled Black History Rising. The selection includes his second film, The Black Press, Soldiers Without Swords, that explores the legacy of Black-owned newspapers. The journalist Vernon Jarrett describes what made them unique. We didn't exist in the other papers. We were neither born, we didn't get married, we didn't die, we didn't fight in any wars, we never participated in anything of a scientific achievement. We were truly invisible unless we committed a crime. But in the black press, the Negro press, we did get married. They showed us our babies being born. They showed us graduating. They showed our PhDs. Stanley's other films playing on the Criterion Channel include Freedom Summer, about the 1964 fight for voting rights in Mississippi, and The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution, on the radical group that spread around the country. The collection also includes a personal film called A Place of Our Own, in which Stanley reflects on his family's home in Martha's Vineyard. We discuss these films and talk about his latest work, Attica, that tells the story of the largest prison revolt in U.S. history. Attica is now playing on Showtime and available for free for a limited time on YouTube. Early in his career, Stanley was mentored by the documentary pioneer William Greaves. I asked Stanley how he chose to focus on history for his own films. Oh, really, I kind of just fell into making history films. Um, <clears throat> the first independent film I made was Two Dollars in a Dream um, about Madam C.J. Walker, a, a, who was the first African-American woman to start with nothing. Well, the first woman, actually, she's listening to the Guinness Book of Records, is the first woman in the world to start with nothing and earn a million dollars. <laughs> and my grandfather was her business partner and her attorney. And after I got out of film school and I was working for Bill Greaves, I was looking around for an independent project. And I, I feel dumb because it took me a couple of years to, to say, hey, why don't, why don't I do the Madam Walker story? Uh, and so that was my, my first uh, independent film. And it was a historical doc. And it just, I got really fascinated by doing archival research and, and, and you know, talking to old people and, and, and just doing the work to make, uh, to make uh, historical docs. And, and I, you know, just continued on with that for most of my career. So, yeah, I was looking at your IMDb credits, and I noticed that film, Two Dollars in a Dream, came out in 1989. And then it took 10 years uh, for your next film, The Black Press, uh, Soldiers Without Swords. What was that like? Here you'd made one film, and then it took you 10 years to make another one. Yeah, it was it was really interesting, you know, after I, <clears throat> when, when I made uh, Two Dollars in a Dream, uh, it, it showed, you know, uh, nationally on PBS, uh, you know, like on a Thursday night, you know, it, at eight o'clock, it was, you know, showing national, nationally. And, and believe it or not, I was literally sitting there by the phone, you know, I was like looking at the phone, you know, like, uh, you know, the phone's going to ring, someone's going to call me. And I learned a great lesson then, you know, because nobody called. Um, and it took me about 10 years to, to make my, my next film. Um, but I had been, you know, I was working in the industry the whole time. But what I learned is, you know, that that, you know, in, in, when you make a film, you, you want to also have the next one, you know, in development. So, you know, the, the dream is, you know, you have one coming out, you have one that you're working on and you have one in development. But I but I, I really learned a, a lot um, with Two Dollars in a Dream that, that I wanted to have something in development at all times. In many of these films, it feels like you're racing against time to, to capture memories while people are still alive. And I, I feel that in your film Freedom Summer, uh, which came out 50 years after the events that it depicts in, in 1964. Um, I wonder what you've learned about getting people to reach deep into their past to, to tell these stories. 
Yeah, I mean, one one thing that, that, you know, in making these films, sometimes, you know, we think about, about ourselves, unfortunately, as the kiss of death, because so many people pass away, you know, right after we, we've made we've made, made the film. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, that, that I, I've learned a lot, you know, from Two Dollars and a Dream, you know, my first film, we were interviewing women who worked for the Madam Walker company, you know, and, and some would, 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 would almost, like, not let us in the door. You know, others, you know, we... We'd, we'd come in the door and they'd be dressed in, you know, their most beautiful clothes and they'd serve champagne, you know, and this is a 95 year old woman, you know, and, and, and I, I started, you know, I really realized that, that, you know, we, we think about old people a lot, older people a lot as like this one thing. You know, but they're not. You know, they're 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 these personalities that that uh, you know really have were established. You know, from when they were kids and, and growing up, and and um, a lot of times what we try to do is 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 give you that personality in the film. You know, so that they're not only uh, people that we're interviewing, but they're really they're really characters, and then we we try to I try to interview them so their characters come through in the film. When I think about Freedom Summer. It's about the push to register black voters in Mississippi after decades of lynchings and laws that were designed to exclude them. And now here we are nearly 60 years later, we're battling a new wave of laws designed to exclude black voters. And I, I wonder what your study of history teaches you about this moment. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, 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 that we all, you know, especially African-Americans, you know, we all want to think about you know, our, our history of our country and our progress, you know, is this upward thing, you know, like it's like, you know, we start from here and we just go, go up and up and we, and we change and we, we always change for the better and, and we get, but it's not that way, you know, it's, it's more like a roller coaster, you know, it, it, it's, it's really a roller coaster ride. And, um, you know, in, in many ways, uh, certain things that are happening with vote, with voting rights, especially not in many ways, but in one, in some real ways, um, things that are happening with voting rights are, we're kind of, you know, in, in that down period. And, and, but that's to be expected. I think that, you know, if, if we don't keep pushing for change, if we don't keep trying to, to change this country and, and, and this world and make it better, um, then it, it, it doesn't happen. And we, if we lay back and say, okay, now we've done it now, now we've, we've reached the promised land, then the promised land gets snatched out from under us. You know, the way American history is taught in schools, uh, we tend to lump civil rights history into the period of Martin Luther King's career, which, you know, which includes the events of, uh, of Freedom Summer. And then by the late 60s, the history gets more contentious, more uh, uh, fractionalized, uh, and th the focus shifts from a nonviolent pr philosophy to more armed self-defense, and, and that's represented in your film, The Black Panthers. And I wonder if telling that story was more difficult than earlier chapters of, of civil rights history that you'd covered. No, I mean, I, I really don't think so. I, I think in some ways the Black Panthers was, was really all of, a part of it, you know, and, and, and the Black Panthers were really my generation. So by the time, you know, I was, you know, 18, 21, um, you know, I I personally was starting to look at the nonviolent civil rights movement and say, you know, has it gone as far as it could go? And and also I was raised in New York City and 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 really the classic civil rights movement of Martin Luther King um, was really a Southern movement, you know, or, or, or most of it was 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 a Southern movement. And the things that they were fighting for, you know, voting rights, being able to sit down at a restaurant, you know, being able to go to a swimming pool, go to a library, you know, those things we already had in the North. And so that the Black Panthers was were much more of an urban movement and dealing with or trying to deal with, or at least talking about the problems, you know, that, that we were having in the North. And, and also, you know, they, they were young people and, and, you know, I was young and, and, and they look so cool, you know? So, so in, in, in some ways, you know, the, the, the film was not easier, but, um, you know, I, I could get into it in a different way because that was really, you know, my generation. And, um, you know, I, I was really in awe, you know, of, of, of the Panthers and, and in awe of, of speaking, uh, you know, to, to so many of the people, um, you know, uh, Kathleen Cleaver and, and Big Man and so many of the people that we talked to in the film.
that kind of speaks to your interest in making the film and doing research and interviews uh, for it. I wonder, like, bringing the film out into the world, putting it on public television, um, was the Black Panthers more of a tricky subject than uh, than Freedom Summer or some of some of the other civil rights? I mean, it, it was really weird when we were making the uh, the Black Panthers because it it was at at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, and so so that you know it was like it, it, it was almost surreal, you know, because once again. Um, there were protests uh, against police violence, you know, and the Black Panthers started because of the police violence in Oakland. So it was it was really um, interesting. And and when we were sending cuts to PBS, you know, they they had like kind of no comments. You know, they were like, "Oh yeah, it's great," and we and we were like looking at each other, you know, like, "Wait a minute!" In the edit room, you know, we're like, well, "Are they even looking at this thing?" Because I I'm not sure that that you know. Um, but you know, I mean, they were they were totally supportive, and I mean, and and, and when when I make films, I I try not to you know think you know really at all about you know the platform of them, you know, so that the so that you know the Black Panthers I I think would have been the same film if we made it for PBS, if we made it for Showtime, if we made it for Netflix. I you know I'm not oh this is PBS so let's worry about the language, you know in these films you know we don't really worry about the language or nudity you know or or, or anything um, you know we we say you know let the let the, uh, the the network or the cable provider, whatever you know, um, deal with that because I, I can't I can't I can't second guess or third guess myself. You know, I'm just gonna make the film, and and if they want to talk about the language or something in the film, then, then we can talk about it. Stanley usually maintains a silent presence behind the camera, but he took a different approach in a place of our own about the black community on Martha's Vineyard in the town of Oak Bluffs. Stanley tells that story through the prism of his own family with a deeply personal narration. My father was the one who insisted on buying the house in Oak Bluffs, but then divorced my mother six months later. He and I never talked much, but after losing my mother, I'm hoping things can change between us. This summer, I've invited him back to the vineyard to stay with me. Even after all these years, it's hard for me to forgive him or to understand what drove him to break up the family. A Police of Our Own is now almost uh, 20 years old. I wonder if that felt like a different film to make after, uh, after you had made some histories, which was really asking other people about their experience. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, it, it's my one personal film. What I always say joking, jokingly is it's going to be my one and only personal film. Um, you know, I mean, making a, a personal film is, is just really different, you know. And um, luckily I had great collaborators uh, on the film, you know, who, who would just tell me, you know, you know, you just got to go there. You know, if you're going to make a personal film, you have to make it personal, you know. And, and one of the things that, 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 that made the film work or, or made me able to work on the film is I became convinced that nobody was going to ever see this film because it was so terrible, <clears throat> you know. And so I, I can say whatever I want because nobody's going to ever see this thing. And, uh, you know, they I would just go into... Uh, to a room by myself and, and they would and, and the editor and 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 the uh co-producer and the associate producer would, would have a list of questions and 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 i would just talk into a microphone like you know um and and they would like they would ask us like okay so so you went to you know a, a, a way predominantly white uh, private school in new york you know when did you first learn that you were black you know and i would just talk about it, about it you know in, into a tape recorder and then you know, we fashioned a, a a narrative, a film, a film from a lot of that really, really, really personal stuff. Um, but you know, it, it it that is a whole different ball game. You know, making a personal film. Um, you know, if, if you look at you know most filmmakers, you know, there's there's a few filmmakers who make personal films, and that's what they do. But you know, to to make a certain other type of film and then to make a personal film and 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 
a, a place of our own kind of mix is history, but with also a personal narrative about my family and especially about, about my father and about my relationship with my father. Um, but it, it, it was a very, very different ballgame making, making that film. It was really hard. I'm so glad that it's part of uh, this group. I hadn't watched it since 2004 and I was uh, rewatching it. It felt really strong. Yeah, I just, I just I just want to say say one thing. I mean, I, again, I thought that 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 the film, you know, uh, I convinced myself that the film would never be seen, and and actually, it was in the Sundance competition, you know, and like, and, and 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 it was it was it was really it was really strange. You know, people would see me on the elevator and they say, "I feel like I really know you now." I'm like, "Oh God." Now we turn to Stanley's latest film, that's co-directed by Tracy Curry, Attica, about the largest prison uprising in U.S. history that took place in 1971. Stanley and Tracy conducted dozens of new interviews with participants and eyewitnesses. The prisoners were rising up against inhumane conditions. They held prison guards as hostages at knife point. After four days of negotiations, the police retook the prison with extreme violence recounted by former prisoners. This was a holiday for the police. We ain't got no guns to shoot back. You know what it is to shoot somebody and they can't shoot back? That's, that's a holiday. Lord have mercy. And all they were saying was, save me a nigga. That's what they was hollering to each other. I was scared. I've done bad things, but I never did shit this bad. I said, now, these guys are real fucking cold-blooded killers and shit. Until that moment came where the sh- killing really started, when I realized that you're not that fucking bad guy no more, man. These motherfuckers is worse than you. You've said that you think Attica is your best work, and I wonder if you can reflect on how your 40 years of experience went into the making of that film. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I at, at least I try to, to take everything that, that I've ever learned and 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 discovered about filmmaking and put it into you know every every next film and and so that every film you know um you learn more and hopefully you know you, you can get a chance to put that you know into the into the film i think that that one of the things you know a bunch of things about attica look it's a, it's an incredible incredible story you know it's a real roller coaster ride you know the the people that we interviewed um are just incredible from you know the former prisoners to the observers, to the people in the town, uh, the people who were, were related to the guards that were held hostage, you know, the politicians, the newsmen. Um, they're all just, you know, in, in incredible interviews. Uh, and then we have incredible footage that's never been seen before um, that, that allows us to tell the story in, 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 in all its complexity. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that, that one of the things about, you know, doc filmmaking, you know, is, is that a lot of it is, 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 is luck, you know, and, and, and just, you know, especially historical docs, you know, is finding stuff that's amazing. You know, there's this one clip where, you know, during Attica, you know, NBC News or somebody went to the town and they filmed their correspondent walking down the street. And as he's walking down the street, he's like, There's factory towns and there are college towns. Attica is a prison town. You know, and and, and I just like, you know, we couldn't have written it better, you know, and then we can go off into talking uh, to the the townspeople about Attica and, and, and they also say that it was a prison town that, you know, most people in Attica earned their livings uh, in some ways connected to the prison. So it's, it's, it's all those things and it's also kind of it's this roller coaster ride but it's a complexity of the story because on one level you know there's these thousand inmates who've taken over the prison and taken hostages so that uh law enforcement can't come in and take the take the prison back or the hostages that they threaten to kill the hostages but on the other hand so they're in the yard the guards and law enforcement are all around on top of the walls with guns aimed down at them for five days. On the other hand, there's townspeople 
collected outside who are, you know, crying and fainting, talking about their relatives inside. On the other hand, there's Nelson Rockefeller, who's governor of New York and finally controls the prison system. And on, and on top of that, he's talking on the phone constantly with the president of the United States is Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon's recording all those phone calls. You know, so it, it's just this really kind of multi-layered, complicated story that says so much about not only the prison system, but about power, about race, and about so many things that are still uh, relevant today. I wonder in 1971, when Attica took place, what your interpretations of it were at the time as a young man? You know, I, I kind of remember it, it, it you know, not vague. I, I, I remember it, you know, it, I remember the takeover. I remember, you know, wow, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're holding the, the, this, this thing. Cause you know, yeah, you've had prison rebellions, but they end very quickly usually. But because they had the hostages, this didn't, this didn't end. Um, and, and the news cameras, you know, were invited in. So, you know, we got, we got a taste of what was happening there. Um, we didn't get a taste like we would today because they were shooting on 16 millimeter film and they, you know, Attica is 250 miles from New York. So they had to get the film, fly it back to New York, develop it, cut it and put a little bit of it on the air. And, and most of it didn't make the air. So, so I remember that, you know, the, the event. And then I remember uh, when they took the prison back. And, and 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 people died and and just this feeling of like oh no you know like well, you know what did they do you know like what happened um and you know one of the reasons why i wanted to make this film for so long is because i never quite understood what happened you know and i think i really wanted to know one what happened at the end but two what happened at the beginning you know why did the prisoners you know risk their lives to take over the prison the story of what happened, uh, especially when law enforcement retook the prison, is inc uh, incredibly brutal, and uh, and, and pa it's painful to watch just in the running time of the film, uh, although satisfying because it's uh, such a well-told story. But uh, the the pain and trauma of, of living through that, um, I wonder how you and your team you know, deal with that month after month, interviewing people, asking people to relive horrific moments in interview after interview. Um, you know, how do you live with that for the extended period of, uh, of time when you're making a film? You know, I, I, I think um, it's, it's really delicate when you're doing the interviews, you know, um, you know, and, and, and you, you have to also, um, deal with 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 the people you're interviewing on a, on a on a on another level that you don't usually ha have you know to kind of see how the the trauma uh, of of retelling these tales are affecting them in real time you know and 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 maybe you know you need to take breaks and and you know because most of the time people don't say hey i you know hey it, it's it's too horrible i can't talk you know but but you have to be really really sensitive to it um, while you're filming, I, I think you know, in in some ways that you know the the filmmaker in in, in the team kind of takes over. You know, um, you know when when you see, and, and this is just me, you know, trying trying to be as real as possible about this. You know, when you see the horrible photos and and and, and the footage of them actually shooting and killing people that that you know they filmed, when you see that. Um, you know, it's, oh my God, this is horrible. This is horrible. But we can now tell this story. Okay, so part of you as a filmmaker is saying, okay, we can tell this story. And now the stakes are higher because we have the material and we have to get it right. You know, we can't, you know, we can't, we, we owe it to, to, the, to the, the people involved to get this story right. And you know, the, the, the film again is not only about the prisoners who took over the prison, but the guards who were held hostages and their families, uh, you know, who were held hostage by the event um, and the guards that were killed uh, in the takeover. We had one of those uh, ex-prisoners, Tyrone Larkins, uh, join us for the film's premiere at the Toronto Film Festival. It's rather incredible in the film how many people are still around 
to tell their story uh, 50 years later. I wonder what uh, you've heard from people who are in the film now that it's uh, been out in the world and reaching audiences. I, I think that, that, that uh, you know, they're, they're, when we talk to them, they're very happy that, that we told the story and very happy uh, with the way that we told the story. Um, but the story is painful, you know, when we had had our first big screening in New York where, you know, it was easier than Toronto for for a lot of the uh, the prisoners, the former prisoners to come. Uh, we had a therapist in the audience, you know, and, and in, in the back of the room. And, you know, we announced that in the beginning that if anybody, you know, wants to talk uh, and, and feel it's too much, you know, um, she's there and, and, um, and you can talk to her. And uh, several people, you know, took advantage of, uh, of that offer. Today we are reflecting on new challenges and horrors in, in our industrial prison uh, complex. Um, so what does this 50-year-old story of Attica um, uh, teach us about today? Uh, I, th I think the, the, the thing that, that's said over and over again by the former prisoners uh, about what they wanted and and about and by the observers who who came in to kind of observe the negotiating um and these were prominent newspaper people and lawyers that the prisoners invited in to observe the thing that's said over and over again is is they just wanted to be treated like human beings you know and 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 they never were saying you know oh we want to be excused from the crimes that we committed we want to have new trials they were just saying that that yeah we're in prison um but we just need to be treated like human beings I, and, and I think, you know, that's a lesson still that, that, you know, that we need to treat the people who are incarcerated um, like human beings. Um, but one of the lessons uh, for me is, is, is kind of taken off one of the lines in the film where I, we, um, we talk about the first night where they're outside in the yard and, and you know, it, night falls and they're, they're kind of camped out outside. And one of the prisoners says, you know, he's, it's the first time he's seen the night sky in 22 years, you know? And, and I just always think about that, you know? And, and one of the things that we don't think about, you know, and, and, the, and our prison system in a way is, is, is geared so that we don't think about it. You know, the prisons are, are out in the middle of nowhere. They're, you know, they're, they're, you know, like Attica, 250 miles from New York City. So we don't think about the prisoners, but, but hopefully um, Attica, the film makes you think about uh, the prisons and the prisoners for for a little bit, and you know, there's two million people, over two million people in the United States that are in prison, um, and two million people that that are not going to see the night sky tonight because they're in prison. At Doc NYC, we selected Attica as one of our 15 films on the Doc NYC shortlist, our collection of uh, some of the best films of the year. Uh, the film is now on the shortlist um, for the Oscars. The 15 films that will get winnowed down to five nominees. And I was, as I was looking through your IMDb credits and, and the, this four decades of history, I was surprised to realize you've never been nominated for an Oscar before. No, I, I haven't. And, um, you know, I'm very excited about, about, about the, uh, the possibility, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a real thrill, um, to, to be on the short list. But, you know, I mean, one of the things that's happened, you know, on the shortlist is, is that, you know, just being on the shortlist has given the film momentum and, 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 and uh, so many more people know about the film and have seen the film. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, that, that, that this recognition does. So, I, you know, I, I, hope, I hope that that the film is nominated, but, you know, also um, that, that more and more people see the film. And, and that's what's really important. As I wrap this up, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, your film, A Place of Our Own, and I'm thinking about your father, Stanley Nelson Sr., uh, who's, who's in that film. Uh, he was a dentist, part of that generation that, um, that pulled their families uh, into the, the middle class. Um, and I wonder what your father uh, uh, thought about uh, you going into, into film. Um, I, I think that, you know, um, my father was a dentist at one point. He said, you know, well, you know, you, you know, you can always take over my practice. 
Um, and I was like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that, that I, want, I want to go into dentistry. I think that, um, you know, that, that, that um, when he saw that, that I had some, somewhat, uh, some kind type of success and I was able to actually make films and, 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 and uh, you know, build a life and a family, you know, around making films, I think he was really, you know, proud. But, you know, my father's great quote that we actually quote around the house all the time is, is uh, you know, we, we won some award or, or, or a film got into Sundance and we were like, yeah, we were running around. And my father said, uh, well, that's great, but is there any uh, monetary remuneration? So that's what he thought. <laughs> uh, spoken like a dentist. Yeah, <laughs> he was a dentist. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what did, what did he think about being in a place of our own? My father was, was a real character. You know, he died about four or five years ago. He was a hundred when he died. So, you know, and he lived with, he lived with me for the last, uh, nine, 10 years of his life. So anybody who says he's a place of our own, they always ask, you know, how was your relationship with your father? He lived, he lived with my family for the last nine or 10 years of, of his life. He loved being a star, you know. <laughs> he, he, you know, I mean, you know, the bottom line is, is he loved being a star. He loved being on camera. I want to thank Stanley Nelson for speaking with me. His new film Attica is now playing on Showtime and is available for free for a limited time on YouTube. In February, the Criterion Channel will present Black History Rising, the documentaries of Stanley Nelson containing five of his films. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Norden-Swan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pure Nonfiction. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. You can read our show notes and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Nonfiction.net.